So I'm here to talk today about responsible consumerism. Um, I started a company, MetEvaluate. We're building an information system, a web application, to help people be more responsible <coughs> consumers. What does that mean? Uh, it means products that are more energy efficient, longer lasting, but it also means products that were made by better producers, more ethical producers. So it's really about self-determination, and it's about supporting a system of production that reflects your values. Um, now, normally we think of the world in linear terms. So what I want to do is share with you a very simple idea, which is that there's a, a real big difference between an action and a behavior. An action has a very linear force. Even a million individual actions still just exert a linear force. So all these acts of consumption by themselves aren't going to make a big difference. But a behavior has a kind of logic to it, and that's what can spread virally and create an exponential kind of force, a transformational force. So when you study uh, complex dynamical systems, you often see this thing where a very small event ends up having a system-wide effect. Uh, even though the system seems to be in equilibrium, imperceptibly behind the scenes there's a kind of buildup of forces. And when the conditions are right, there's a critical state, and that's what allows a very simple thing to unlock and have this massive transformational effect. I do think that if we can work towards and create the right conditions, responsible behavior, responsible consumerism can actually lead to that kind of transformation. So where are we at today? Um, we definitely have responsible consumerism in a, in a form, but I'm going to say this is kind of a weak form. Uh, we have 80% of us saying that, you know, if there's a product in front of us and it's more ethical, we'll definitely buy it, assuming it doesn't cost more. 15% of us will pay more and even go out of our way for a more ethical product. We see things like Walmart uh, definitely improving and putting pressure on the supply chain to improve packaging and whatnot. I mean, these are positive things, so I don't want to be too disparaging by saying they're weak, but I think there's a much stronger form of responsible consumerism. And that's the idea that we, as consumers, can dictate the methods of production. Um, so, what stands in the way of that? Right now, the main problems I, th I see are a lack of meaningful options. I mean, it's not that they're not out there, but they're certainly not apparent and not at the level of mass consumption. Also, there's greenwashing, which creates a lot of cynicism and kind of uh, undermines this effort of responsible consumerism. So what I'm really talking about here is there's poor information. And I think that's the first thing we have to address if we're going to set the conditions for responsible consumerism. So the first thing we can do, and this is collectively but individually, is develop domain expertise. Because every type of product is very specific, it's got a very specific use. We have to first understand what is that use. We have to be able to describe to consumers and communicate to them how to evaluate products um, so that they can think more clearly about them. And then the next thing we do is I think we, we communicate to them in a way of ceteris paribus, which is basically all other things remaining equal. I think it's counterproductive to differentiate between normal products and sustainable products. Um, there's too much of a threshold and a tension there. I don't think it's necessary. I think the first thing we can do is just tell people, like, here are the best products to meet your needs, and of these, which are the most ethical? Um, this is the 80% of the consumers I talked about earlier who really are the ones who shape our system of mass production. So if we can get them on board and say, you know, this is the obvious choice, the ethical choice, that's going to exert a huge competitive pressure on manufacturers. And uh, this is where really, you know, the last point is that we have to take control of the talking points. Manufacturers and marketers have basically dominated the conversation for too long. And there's information out there that lets us see in behind the scenes of products into the supply chains and lets us make some really interesting observations about those. I think if we can and we start making those observations, like I said, collectively and individually, we're going to be able to change the conversation in a very important way. But I see some obstacles, and like I said, it's not these first two, the lack of options and greenwashing. I think better information does away with those as obstacles. We look at some others that are a little more, a little more pernicious. Uh, consumption is basically a bunch of individual acts, and we've learned those over our lifetime. They're ingrained behaviors. Um, it's really hard to tell somebody, be more responsible, because when they're in a behavioral pattern, that kind of idea, it, they're insulated from it. It exerts a very weak force. Luckily, these systems that we're in right now, we're finding they're not working for us. So these patterns, they're, they're, they're breaking down a little bit, and this gives us an opportunity. I think we can insert new questions, new ways of evaluating products, but we have to do it in a way that's subtle. That is, we have to be really specific, and we have to steer people incrementally towards sustainable, better products. We can't ask for a wholesale reinvention of people. That's just too much of, a, well, that's too much of an obstacle, and people are going to resist that. Now, the next problem that we run into is bounded rationality. This is what consumer psychologists term the breakdown of our rational processes when we're in the act of consuming, or at least in the act of trying to find what is our best product, what's the optimal product. What happens is for most high-involvement products, there's more than a few things to think about. There's features, strengths, weaknesses, trade-offs. 
After a while deliberating, the average consumer uh, has this kind of, hits this wall, has this kind of mental breakdown, and get, does what's called satisficing. That's what marketers call it. They basically go with some novel characteristic, some new feature. Uh, they go with a brand that just sort of reflects their identity. Basically, they'd rather make a decision than make the best decision. And uh, the studies around this have basically pointed to insufficient information resources being the reason that we suffer this breakdown. To promote responsible consumerism, for that to happen, we need to remain rational. So we have to do everything in our power, I think, to create better information resources. And uh, the third obstacle I want to talk about is passivity. I don't think it's our natural state as humans, but I think we've gotten here. 60 plus years of mass media. And uh, when it comes to talking about mass production, it's a very complex thing now. I mean, it's very abstract. I, I couldn't even really begin to tell you all of the steps that lie behind your average product. But like I said earlier, the information is out there. So in terms of mass media, I think that the internet is doing great things in terms of creating a more engaged population. And I think that we have an opportunity to use what's called intelligence augmentation, which are basically interactive information resources to help people deal with the complexity of mass production, basically to let them draw inferences and have conversations that are on the scale and complexity of this system of mass production. All right, so rather than talk about intelligence augmentation as a concept, I thought it would be fun to just talk about some of the key characteristics that I think are ideal for a good IA system. The first is transparency. Uh, you know, it's really tempting to give recommendations to the public to sort of come up with models and, uh, and, and have this kind of black box that spits out recommendations, but I don't think those are very helpful. I think what we need to give people is an engaged, transparent system so they can see the, the rationalizations that are going on within it and they can see the data that underlies it and they can follow that through to the logical conclusions. It's gonna help shape their model of reality. Uh, the next thing is that I think the system has to be independent. I mean, a lot of companies wanna create resources to influence consumers and then even if you independently do create a resource, there's gonna be a lot of pressure to co-opt it from the obvious vested interests. So I think you have to find a way to make a system that's self-sufficient. At the very least, think about how you're gonna fund it before you build it. Okay, the next thing that it needs is it needs to be specific and organized. Uh, now this is basically information architecture. This is really like the key component to intelligence augmentation. Uh, it means taking all these disconnected bits of data. When I talked earlier about these supply chains that are highly complex, taking all those disconnected bits and making a coherent picture out of them. It means sort of creating these fine-grained arguments and then organizing them into higher order arguments that allow for these conversations to happen. That's no mean feat, by the way, but it's, it's definitely doable, and there's a lot of work in that. Now, the next uh, thing I want to talk about is signals. Basically, a system that you build has to communicate. That is the use of it, the choices that are made within it. When one user does something, that's got to be communicated to all the other users in the system. And I don't think you should be creating signals that, that sort of denote a fixed state or, a, or a, a singular discrete choice. I think what you want to do is sort of frame them in terms of movement, velocity, uh, an intention, because when those are shared by other users, that kind of creates like a virtual momentum. And that is the positive feedback kind of loops that a good system can create that allows for emergent behavior. And lastly, I don't think you can dictate the system too carefully. I mean, you can create the, the groundwork. Basically, the point of this talk is that what you're doing is setting conditions. And in this case, you can create an information system, but what it's gonna do is it's gonna find a community if it's any good. And really, it has to have the potential for the community to be able to take it and run with it, to evolve its form and its content. In conclusion, I guess I'd like to say that, you know, as a company, we've bitten off a very specific portion of this, just a few types of products, and there's thousands of products out there, and each one of them is gonna take the development of domain expertise. It's gonna require a huge effort to research the production and the supply chains. And, uh, and then there's gonna be a big effort to communicate that to people. But I definitely think it's worth it. I mean, even if it's just the conditions and you can't guarantee that responsible consumerism is gonna emerge, I think it's more than worth the effort because if it does emerge, I mean, I think that will be the key that will bring us to a place where we're actually adopting these new sustainable technologies. And it's actually the place where competitive pressures are gonna be placed on producers to adopt the best practices. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs>